Oklahoma is the land of second chances. Who were the people that made it so? We'll dig for the golden threads they've woven through Oklahoma history. The Red River Institute and Atwoods are proud to present Oklahoma Gold. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert, along with award-winning author and Southern Nazarene University historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll find the golden nuggets of Oklahoma history here now Oklahoma Gold. Rollers, dusters, and black blizzards. John J. Dwyer, tell me this story. Well, it's one of the most haunting chapters in Oklahoma history, the Dust Bowl. It's a big story in a big land, so let's jump right in. By the beginning of the 1930s, Gwen, since around the time of Oklahoma statehood, farmers had cleared off, plowed, and harvested 33 million acres of buffalo country in the American Great Plains. This comprised an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania and, and reached across six or seven states. These sturdy pioneers had not, however, adapted their agricultural practices to the verities of their untamed new prairie lands. There was just a lack of knowledge of uh, the particularities of the, the Great Plains, in particular the Southern Great Plains. They had cleared fields of wind and flood breaks. The, in turn, they lost the thin layer of topsoil that allowed native grasses to root, to retain the region's precious moisture, and to keep the earth from blowing away. They'd unknowingly set in motion a ticking time bomb of unimaginable proportions. Already facing falling prices and mounting supplies of unsold products, farmers grew even more nervous when precipitation declined in 1930 from the high levels of the 20s. Then, around noon on January 21st, 1932, a day which will live in infamy in the southern Great Plains, a monstrous dust storm formed in the Texas Panhandle. Historian Timothy Egan memorably described the surreal scenario. A cloud 10,000 feet high from ground to top appeared just outside Amarillo, Egan wrote. The winds had been fierce all day, clocked at 60 miles an hour when the curtain dropped over the panhandle. The sky lost its customary white and it turned brownish, then gray, as the thing lumbered around the edge of Amarillo, then a city of 43,000 people. Nobody knew what to call it. It was not a rain cloud. It was not a twister nor was it a cloud holding ice pellets. It was thick, like coarse animal hair. It was alive. People close to it described a feeling of being in a blizzard, a black blizzard, they called it, with an edge like steel wool. That's the end of Egan's quote. It was two miles wide. It roared north and east into Oklahoma. It was the first of 14 horrifying dusters, rollers, or black blizzards were the names they attached to such storms. Fourteen of them struck the panhandle of Oklahoma that year alone. From there, droughts tormented the region in 1932, 34, 36, and 37. Locust plagues struck, and the hideous black dirt monsters swept swarms of lethal tarantulas and centipedes from the Texas and New Mexico Llano Estacado and deserts into the bathtubs, kitchens, and bedrooms of Oklahoma pioneer homes. Children and seniors alike died from bites. Am I the only one that, that sounds hauntingly uh, like uh, the great plagues of old Egypt in uh, the Old Testament with Moses and Pharaoh? They died from bites? Of, from uh, poisonous spiders that had been blown hun sometimes hundreds of miles through the air from other states into their yards and homes. Oh. Meanwhile, and, and if this adds to the... Uh, uh, otherworldliness of it, Gwen, rabbits bred in such numbers during this unnerving era that whole towns would engage in search and destroy missions, killing thousands of rabbits at a time with baseball bats and clubs. They'd surround them out in fields and close in on them in squares. They piled them high in fields to burn. Cattle and horses, meanwhile, suffocated to death in the gigantic oceans of choking dust and children died from pneumonia after their lungs filled with dirt. Tens of millions of tons of northwest Oklahoma topsoil blew away in 1934, 
and then again in 1935. At least 40 dusters struck the Dust Bowl in 1935 and 61 in 1938, and that was seven years after the full-fledged Dust Bowl first set in. That year, 1938, Oklahomans also witnessed the most severe wind erosion in recorded state history. Back in the spring of 1934, meanwhile, Oklahoma dirt, that good old red dirt we love, cascaded into not Lake Tenkiller or Eufaula, the Atlantic Ocean. Red snow fell in New England during the winter of 1934 and 35. In retrospect, one could be forgiven for suggesting that the, the unseen and often seen hand of God was at work reclaiming his own land, best suited for the now slaughtered buffalo for his own purposes. And contrary to one of the many myths engendered by John Steinbeck in his famed novel, The Grapes of Wrath, Oklahoma comprised only a portion of Dust Bowl territory. The ravaged plains spread from the Texas Panhandle north to Nebraska and from the Rocky Mountain foothills of Colorado and New Mexico through half the state of Kansas. The epic malady devastated Oklahoma's northwestern uh, most seven counties, that's Cimarron, Texas, Beaver, Harper, Ellis, Woodward, and Woods, but it savaged many others all the way to the, the Arkansas line. Again, contrary to the images of Steinbeck and others, the vast majority of Oklahomans didn't leave. Uh, the ones that left and went to California or elsewhere are the ones that got the publicity, but most remained in their own state. Some stayed on their land or their communities. Others took often part-time New Deal jobs or make work, and many went to cities to find employment. Others left for a period, then returned. As we talked about in a previous program, Wanda Jackson's family, the famous singer, went to California, then returned four years later. Some, particularly in the state's larger cities, actually prospered during the period. Like many Oklahomans, panhandle farmer Caroline Henderson and her husband Will set their jaws like flint and stayed on their land, in their case, for over 60 years. Though the Dust Bowl's terrors tortured them, ruined them financially, and nearly physically killed them, Neither it nor anything else could drive them out. The Henderson's marathon of mostly silent suffering stands in the 21st century as a lasting monument to the unshakable resolve of a people determined to forge a better life in the Oklahoma countryside than they might have had elsewhere. Caroline Henderson's classic memoir, Letters from the Dust Bowl, is considered the greatest nonfiction account in print of the Dust Bowl. Listen to one of her many powerful excerpts from that book. There are days, Caroline Henderson wrote, when for periods one cannot distinguish the windows from the solid wall because of the solid blackness of the raging storm. After one such storm, I scraped up a dustpan full of this pulverized soil in the first preliminary cleaning of the bathtub. Dust to eat and dust to breathe and dust to drink. Dust in the beds and in the flower bins, on dishes and walls and windows, in hair and eyes and ears and teeth and throats to say nothing of the heaped up accumulation on floors, sometimes so thick it lies in ripples on the kitchen floor and windowsills after one of the bad days. Caroline Henderson from her epic book, Letters from the Dust Bowl. What a golden thread. This is Oklahoma Gold. They call them rollers, dusters, and black blizzards. We're talking about the Dust Bowl, and this is what I've taken away so far. It was more horrible than I ever thought. It was more widespread through the United States, and more Oklahomans stayed here and lived beyond the Dust Bowl. John J. Dwyer. I can hardly wait to hear what the golden nugget is going to be. That's right. They toughed it out. Tough people were our forefathers and foremothers from that generation. Then they went and won World War II after that and fought the Cold War bravely to deliver the, the world from communism. One of them, a well-known one, Guyman resident, Virginia, France, grew up in Beaver County, heart of the Oklahoma Panhandle and the Dust Bowl during the 30s. And she remembers that every time she would cough as a little girl after developing dust pneumonia, she would cough up mud. How'd you like to do that? You cough in the studio, you cough up mud. 
She went to the doctor a few years ago at age 92, and the doctor said, you've got a tiny ridge of dust in the bottom of your lungs. It had been there for 80 years. Well, the worst recorded dust storm in American history, Gwen, engulfed northwest Oklahoma and much of the rest of the southern Great Plains on April 14, 1935. The aforementioned Virginia, France, experienced the historic horror as a child. Author of the Dust Bowl memoir, Keeping It Together, and a woman whom Ken Burns featured in his documentary, The Dust Bowl, a few years ago, she told me uh, when I interviewed her in Guyman a few years ago, not long before her death at, at age 95. And by the way, at, at age 93, she looked like she was about 55. This woman, even with all the, the dust in her lungs, she was a tough person. She'd lived through it, and she, she looked uh, very well, very beautiful. And she says of that day, Black Sunday, on the Southern Plains in 1935, it was a beautiful day. We had gone to church. My cousin and one of my friends had come home with me to play and eat dinner. We'd already eaten, and we were playing outside as we always did when we looked up and saw it coming. We had no warning. It came from the northwest. We saw rolling walls of dirt. It almost reminded you of animals. It was quiet, no noise, stalking you like it was alive. The birds were flying ahead of it madly, trying to get out of the way. We knew this was the granddaddy, the worst. We went to the cellar, just like we did all the time. And you read accounts of folks that were there on Black Sunday, there were some pretty awful accounts of what it was like trying to get to the cellar, trying to rescue children and animals. It was a horrible day. Well, and then uh, Dr. Ger Daryl Gibson, uh, retired Guyman dentist who lives in Edmond now, uh, he recalled uh, going to bed that night as a little boy and his mother put a wet cloth or wet towel over all the children's beds to keep the dust from falling in on them during the night. Well, what to make of such a time and place and people? One Oklahoma child migrant to California, poetess Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel, wrote beautiful verse nearly until her 2007 death. This included the poem Living with the Land, it memorably conveyed the ambivalent but deep emotions residing in the hearts of the people of the High Plains country of Dust Bowl, Oklahoma. And she wrote in her poem, Lizzie Bates was washing dishes when the first drops pelted. Light March rain lasted only 10 minutes, but the roof leaked above the stove and smelled of sour lumber. When it stopped, Lizzie came outside and looked at the hard sky. This will be a hard season, not another drop of rain until November, she said, not spoken bitterly, but as a mother knows her own child's weakness and loves it anyway. So how does one dig a golden nugget out of such a long, bitter ordeal, which occurred simultaneous to, don't forget, the Great Depression, which was the worst of its kind in history? Perhaps it has something to do with the courage and heart of our forefathers and mothers, who fought through every conceivable terror and heartbreak and built a state to pass on to us. Virginia France, still vibrant in her mid-90s, wistfully recalled how a cousin who delivered mail in the, the area of the panhandle where they lived gave her mother the precious gift of 100 baby chickens during the depths of the Dust Bowl. And these are the words of Virginia France that form our unusual, rather, golden nugget today. So we cleaned out that brooder house, and we cleaned out that brooder stove, and we got it all ready for the chickens. And those of you that had chickens, they do become like little pets. And she continued, they came and we taught them how to drink and where to go to get the feed. Mother'd go by and see them every day, just like her own children. She cherished them. One night we woke up and there were lights flickering in that house. We looked out and the brooder house was completely burning up. I saw my mother kind of on the edge of the shadows and just crying like her heart was broken. But the next morning, she came out and fixed us pancakes for breakfast. She said, we haven't had pancakes for a while, so I'm going to fix them this morning. And then what did she do? She led the family in singing a hymn. I think it was higher ground, Virginia France recalled. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. John J. Dwyer, that's Oklahoma Gold. <laughs>